So typically the way I try to do this is I, um, as, as I told you, I do it in a blackboard uh, style in the sense like I uh, read, uh, write down everything that I teach most of the time. Sometimes if I'm too uh, tired or too stingy, then I will not do that. But most of the time I do this. And so today also I will try it. So I have my iPad, which is connected and I will open up a page in iPad. I will share it and I will just write over there and you can see me uh, in the screen. So with my uh, office computer, you can see. Uh, it is not uh, uh, the best way that one can do because, you know, when I start writing, then what happens is that, you, you know, basically um, you see only the top of my head, but uh, I don't see any other way that I can, I can change that uh, unless we basically go and do it on the blackboard. Okay. So, yeah, so I think uh, all it is recording. So I, I look, took a look at the, uh, to be honest, I didn't look at all the, uh, everyone's uh, answer sheets that you sent me uh, the last day, but I did look at uh, quite a few of them. And uh, uh, I don't think any one of you had actually correctly done all four of them. Okay. So, so we will actually, at some point of time, look at these problems. Uh, just want to say that you have either done it very easily. So in three steps, you have uh, solved the problem or you have done you know, five pages. Obviously these are two extremes. And so that should not be the case. Okay. Uh, so some of them, some of you have gone pretty near, but uh, most of the class I don't think have done it uh, correctly. Okay, so we will come to those problems again. So, um, so what we start is let me share the screen first. Okay, let me share the screen and uh, let's see if these things will stop working. Okay, so can you see the screen? Yes, sir, you can. Okay, good. Okay, so the way I would like to start this uh, class is to, you know, very briefly for five minutes, try to recapitulate the history of, uh, of electrodynamics, the way we, we understand it now. Now, as you know, like all branches of physics, almost all of these starts from some experimental fact and we try to build a theory to do these experimental facts, to look at these experimental facts and to understand them. Now, our ED2 of course starts with Maxwell's equation and in Maxwell's equation, electricity and magnetism, these two are combined, okay? But if you look at till early, 1800s, you know, as I write over here, electricity and magnetism were unrelated. Okay. They were unrelated. So people either studied electricity and they found laws governing them. They were mainly the laws of electrostatics and we'll go into that very quickly. Or they studied magnetism and this people have known for thousands of years. In fact, magnetism was known even earlier. Uh, people found magnets, they knew things that attract each other. No, uh, people had compasses and stuff like that. And then uh, with charge optics where they found that they can have static charges that we know right now. No, you have some shiny things, you rub it with a fur, then it gets charged, you get a shock, you know, two balls, they attract each other, things like that. So one of the first advancements was around 1820s when Oersted, so I've written it down so that this is not something that I had to write it on the board, it was too much of writing. So I just wanted to share this. So Oersted, it basically showed that electric currents influences magnets, right? So 
This is what you showed. And if it influences magnets, then obviously some magnetic field has to be created the way we look at it now. So what Orsted was basically showing us is basically looking at this part of the Maxwell's equation where the curl of B is connected to the current density. Now, if you look at the C over here, this C is not the speed of light till now when Orsted wrote this equation, not of course in this form, the C that comes over here is not the speed of light. It is the ratio of the electrostatics and electromagnetic units in electricity. Okay. So it's a constant. Turns out that it is the speed of light and that was what Maxwell considered. So that was in the 1820s. So electric field influences magnet. Yes. Okay. 1830s, little more. Oh, okay. It has gone away. So one of the problem is that a lot of time this sharing just switches off. If I don't do anything on the screen, it switches off. Right. So then we go a few years later, 1830s, so 10 years later, over there, Faraday, he basically points out that relative motion of wear and magnets induces voltage. Okay. So the first thing was electric fields induces magnets. Now we have relative motion of wear and magnets. It induces voltage in the wear. So that basically means it has to create some electric field. So previously it was creating a magnetic field. Now we are creating electric field. So this is what our curl E equation of, of Maxwell's equation come on. Okay. Okay. Moreover, there was also this empirical evidence that there is this absence of single magnets, right? So there are no single magnets. So we have this divergence of B equal to zero. So you can think of some four of the Maxwell's equation in some form already there in the, in the, in, in the experimental uh, world of electricity and magnetism in the early 1800s. So when Maxwell comes in, what he does, so another 30 years later, he removes the restriction of stationary charges. So stationary charges means the divergence of J is zero, so it removes this restriction. So then it modifies the first two equations. It modifies the first two equations. And so the consistency comes in this form. Okay. So you have another uh, uh, part over here. And at the same time, Rudolf Hertz, he measures the speed of light. Okay. He measures the speed of light and finds that the electromagnetic wave travels at a speed which is the same as the speed of light. So this is how the steps in the history of uh, electromagnetism went around. The final thing comes out another 30 years later when Einstein sort of resolves the conflict between this absolute speed C and the Newtonian relativity mechanics. Okay, And so what happens that if you are moving and Einstein sort of resolves it. And so then this whole thing comes together. Okay. So given that this is the is the timeline in some sense, the way things went ahead to get uh, our Maxwell's equation, let us in some sense follow this timeline and try to derive the Maxwell's equation from what we knew uh, experimentally. Okay. So what we want to do is this. 
So this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to have another go at max execution, okay? But uh, with sort of a little bit of help from the historical time. So you will see that we can derive Maxwell's equation by combining three things. First, the laws of electrostatics, okay? That's observed, that's how the whole of So electrostatics, you add Galilean relativity to it, okay? Of course, we do not need because we will consider uh, some velocities which is less than the velocity of C, so we don't need STR right now. And finally, we will sort of use that the existence of the electromagnetic waves will be traveling in vacuum at the speed C. This is again something which just comes from observations, experiments. So if you combine these three, you see that we can actually get Maxwell's equations. So this is something. I don't think uh, this is traditionally done in, in a Maxwell's equation book, although it is actually there. So let me start. With it. So this is where I, this is the introduction. This is where I start writing on the blackboard. So let me open a page and start writing. Don't want this over here, so let me get rid of this. Okay. So, when what happens is when I write in the on my iPad, sometimes I don't check to see whether it's coming on the on your screen. So, if you see this not coming immediately, you let me know. It has happened that I've kept on writing and uh, then I realized that it was not on the screen. So we'll start with this fact, okay? So today's date is uh, 10th March. Okay. Start with the fact basic statement that Coulomb's law is phenomenological. Very simple statement, but you'll see it has a profound implication as we go through it. What does it mean? It means that we know in some way what is the forces was the potential and that's something people have found out or at least that kind of theory was already there. So if I give a number of charges, so given a number of charges, okay, now with the uh, added uh, thing that the dimension of these charges must be small, much small compared to the distance between these charges. So this is something that also you must keep in mind. So dimension of the charges much less than the distance between them. Okay. Then if I write down the interaction energy E, then this interaction energy E can be written as, so I count all the charges, we count pairwise, so be careful, it can be written as half of, so these charges I'll call them Q, sometimes I call it E, so I mean, I'm not very consistent, uh, so please, uh, you know, you try to be consistent, Qs are Qs, Es are sometimes charge of electron, I call it E, but in general, charge is Q. Will be summed over all the charges. So uh, sum of all the charges, keeping into mind that I don't double count. Okay. So sum for i and j, i not equal to j. 
and then it will be qi qj over rij over here this is the charge this qj or qi is the charge of the ith particle of the ith particle and rij is basically the distance modulus between these two charges okay so rij is basically r i minus rj okay now this seemingly very simple equation summarizes the sum total of all knowledge of all experimental fact in electrostatics so we think of the whole of electrostatics the whole of electrostatics is basically summarized in this one equation okay that's what it is right so this equation basically tells us everything that we knew about electrostatics everything that experimentally we knew about electrostatics okay. now so what do i want to do next is this Now, we can look at this equation and we can try to rewrite this equation. We rewrite this equation as the interaction of one charge with the rest of the system. So, we can rewrite this equation. So, we can rewrite this. See, the first one, it was the interaction of all the charges, the mutual interaction of all the charges. Now I'm going to rewrite this in a way where I say, let it be the interaction of one with the rest of the charges. This subtle change in the definition, okay? And so we'll rewrite this, rewrite as interaction of a single charge with the rest of the charges okay. and so i can now write down my e again now the summation becomes two summations where i was going to separate it out the summation over i qi and then summation over j not equal to i and this becomes qj over rij Now, if you look at this equation carefully, then you see that this equation, the second part, so this part, this part, this is the electrostatic potential at the position I. So this is at position I, okay, due to all the other charges. So I can write it like this. So I can write this as basically pi i, which is sum over j not equal to i qi over r i j. Now, if we carefully again look at this equation, you see that over here, the way I have written, so think of the first equation, the way I have written was mutual interaction of all the particles. So it was in some sense action at a distance. So I change some particle over here, immediately the mutual interaction changes instantaneously. Over here also, this is still an action at a distance view, okay? So if I change Ri, then everything has to change. So in picture, if I change the position of Rj, Ri instantaneously feels what has happened elsewhere because this phi i at i changes as soon as I change Rj. Okay. So this is in some sense an action at a distance kind of view till now. Okay, so now we want to go a little ahead. 
okay and try to write this in terms of fields so over here it's still as i said it's still like action at a distance want to write like a field so from this actual for distance you know maxwell's equations are field equations so somewhere we have to come to what we want to write it as a field so over here we must define what is a field so i guess most of you know what is a field but still if someone doesn't know this is very important the field is a local quantity the most important part of a shear word is called local okay the field is a local quantity and then it is defined and it is defined at every spatial point uh apologize for his handwriting i hope you can still read it i mean it's i'm not trying to try to write not trying to write it very carefully so it's not that good okay so this is my definition of a field local quantity and defined at every spatial point So in that sense, I can think of potential as a field. Okay. So it is defined. So when I want to define potential as a field, now if I want to define potential at a field, it has to be defined at every position, every spatial, not only at the ith position. So if you look at the way I've written over here, over here the potential is the potential at the ith. So if I go from the first, if I know how I write down the interaction energy of n number of charges, and then oh. hello, yes, sir, we can hear you. Yeah, no, but I think it's frozen again. This your screen is frozen. It's not moving. Hold on, let me try to again. Oh, I have logged out of Zoom. So I have to log in again to here. Ah, these are all this kind of things I hate. Again, just come back, hopefully. So over here, the potential, the way we have defined it was at positions where the charges were, right? Now, if I have to define my potential at a field, then it should be at all positions, okay? not only at uh, at the charge positions okay so not only at the at the on charge right. so this is what it has to be which basically means i have to write down my phi 
in a slightly different way. When I try to write the potential as a field, then my phi at a position R is basically sum over J QJ R minus RJ. This is different from this equation. So in this equation, the above one, this one, this equation, we were doing a summation with g not equal to i. And this is the potential at the i charge. Whereas by this definition over here, it is the potential at any position r. Okay. So over here, it's important to note, so note, this is important, that my phi r, this is not the same as phi i. There is a subtle difference between these two. So in this phi r, all the charges are taken on the same footing. Whereas in phi i, all the charges are not taking the same footing. Because in phi r, all the charges are taken the same footing, we do not have no j not equal to i constraint. Okay. So we sum over all the charges. So now, if we know these two definitions, we can go and rewrite my energy, the energy that we started it. So we can go and rewrite this energy that we have written for system of charges. And let me rewrite this energy so you can rewrite my energy. Okay. So this energy now can be written like this. So it's written in terms of the potential, this phi r. So this will be half summed over all the charges, which is i. Qi phi at Ri. But then this equation and the first equation are not the same because the first equation we had this positions where these points are, where these individual charges are. So what we have to do is we have to subtract a term to gain Ri. And this is what I'll call i. Okay. So what is the second term? This second term is basically the self action or the self interaction. Okay. So you remove this, you remove this self action term. So the total energy depends only on the mutual interaction. Okay. So see that I have, what I've done is I've slowly building up where I've started something which were in some sense, not in terms of fields because it was not at every position. It was only at point wise, pair wise positions. And from there, I have somehow managed to get rid of the pairwise terms and written it in terms of only the position of each of these uh, uh, charges, given that there is a potential field which is there and each, each of these charges are distributed. Okay. Now, so yes. Isn't phi of r i infinity, yeah. like I mean, one of the terms is qi, right, in phi of r. So there will be a denominator which is zero. Yes. So it will become an infinity, right? Yeah. So how do we make sense yes. of that? So I'll come to this. So there are ways of doing it. In classical ED, there is no way we can deal with this infinity, right? So in classical ED, we cannot deal with these infinities. And this is, of course, 
the problem that is goes into QED, quantum ED, and then there are ways to deal with this interference. But what is important is this infinity or whatever, this undefined part that is there, which is the self-action, it does not change the dynamics of the system. And so I'm going to show you how. At the end of it, we want to learn about the dynamics of the system. And I don't care if there are, you know, artificial infinities in it because of the way we have rewritten the system, as long as it does not change the dynamics of the system. Now, what influences the dynamics of the system? It is the force. So we're going to write down what is the force first. And we'll come back to this question. It's a good question. Obviously, something that we should think of. So we'll come back to it. So write down the force. Okay. So the force, we know, comes from the work done. Okay. Work done. So you move a charge, and the work is done with respect to the charge. That gives you an energy, and that's how you equate the force. Okay, so let us move the ith charge by some small displacement. Okay, so delta ri. Okay, then what we have, we can write down the small change in energy due to the movement of this ith charge. Let me call this delta ei. Okay. This will be given by the force. And the force, you remember, comes from the gradient of the energy. Okay. So this will be the gradient on the I charge of the energy okay. times delta Ri. And this, you know, we defined as some force times. This way. So this is your energy change. Okay. And this is the force which is acting. Now what we want to do is we want to compare this equation. Okay. Compare this equation with the first equation. So there is this equation that you've got. Okay. You compare this with the first equation. Compare this to the first equation. So over here, of course, in a blackboard, it's easy to write down the equations. One of the problems that we faced last time also is in the in Zoom, we cannot have all the equations in front of us. So we have to go up, back, and forth. And uh, so you, if, you are, if you're writing it down along with me, then you can do it in the piece of paper. It's easier to do. So you compare with the first equation, then you will see that what you get is get a force which is, again, the gradient of i. So gradient of the ith particle, okay, is the force on the ith particle, which is equal to qi, qj, over rij, i not equal to j. This I can rewrite, this thing, okay. I can write, rewrite as gradient of i, working on y, and then I have qj over rij, again, i not equal to j. Now, if you look over here, this thing, this is my phi ri, right? This is what how we have defined the phi ri before. So question is, shouldn't we have phi i instead of phi ri? So the question is that, shouldn't we have phi i, okay, instead of phi ri? 
So one thing is I would like to, when, when, when we're done with it, I would like you to go through the steps slowly, okay? There is, no, if you have confusions that will clear out when you go through the steps slowly. If you go back to this formula, okay, you will see that I R I, okay, this thing has an extra self action term. which basically means that this should give an extra contribution. But if it gives an extra contribution, then you have to calculate it. And this is where the question that someone asks comes into play whatever this infinity is if it gives extra contribution then there's an extra infinite force over there so how do you solve it so your first homework problem is this so your homework problem is this you try it out if you cannot do it then ask me for a hint so can you show that self-action term in the potential does not contribute So if you calculate the force due to the self-action term, you will see it doesn't contribute to the force. And that's where the solution of this problem lies. Yes, there are infinities, but it doesn't change the dynamics because those infinities do not contribute to the force. So this is a problem. Go to the self-action term, try to find out why the way we have written over here, why it doesn't contribute to the force. If in the next uh, class, I hope you will at least think about it. If you have no way of going farther, then you can ask me for a hint. I will give you a hint, okay, of how to proceed, okay. So the first problem is show that the self-action term does not contribute. Okay, so this is something that you should do. Now let's go a little ahead. Now let us define an electric field. Okay, so let us define an electric field. So how do you define it? I'll define it in a standard way. Okay, this minus grad pi r. Okay. So such that if I calculate the force of the ith particle, then this is two i e. Now, see what has happened over here. This is a function calculated R in terms of the charges located at RJ. So over here, this function, okay, this is calculated, okay, 
in terms of charges located at object right so a sense this is again this kind of an action at a distance kind of thing so if i change my rj somehow my function will change instantaneously it's still not a local stuff in the sense the e is still not my e okay is still not fully characterized locally because remember i told you the definition of field is it has to be local and has to every space point over here it is not i change my rj i change my ei so local equations i want to write down this whole thing as local differential equations so my goal is to have so my goal is to have local first thing differential equations and this will be supplemented by boundary conditions supplemented by boundary conditions so that is my look uh, uh, goal and if that happens then i can write down all my fields or potentials in terms of this kind of equations where you don't have to worry about if certain change things changes i have to you know instantaneously things will change so that thing we have to get rid of now we'll come to this slowly step by step so what we have is this since we have my e of r okay so over here should have written it over here in a different way hold on yeah since we have my e of r is minus uh, grad of y of r okay the first thing we of course we can say from here is that this implies that if i have my equal of e of r let go to zero now if you look at this equation this equation is a local relation it doesn't have any rj any very net okay so it tells you you take any point if i find the curl of e around that point it has to be zero so we got one local relation next we want the divergence of e of r to do this we will do what you have done many times before we take some volume okay and we take some surface of the volume so this is a volume v your surface s and what we want to do we calculate this quantity where the cyclotron is basically the total over the total area okay so this is s so total area times e of r okay this as you can see it's a normal component of the e right so because the s is normal to the surface and so what we're taking over here is a normal component of the e so this is normal component of e. 
And I can rewrite this. How do I rewrite it? So I rewrite it as sum. So follow this carefully. QJ, then integral over my S, over here should I also address DS. And E of R, I've written in terms of this QJ, right? So I'll have RI minus RJ divided by R I minus uh, hello sir. Yes. Just let uh, am I audible? Just let me finish it. Uh, sure. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, sir, the earlier relation that you wrote uh, del cross E of R, del curl of E zero. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not get why it is completely local. Even even in this case, if I change my distribution, the electric field at each point will change, right? At each point, that's the whole point. At each point, not at i's only. It doesn't have, say anything about ri at specific points. It is at each point. So the definition, the the the, the change between the old way of thinking and the differential equation way of thinking, field way of thinking, is that in field, quantities are, as I said, local equations because these are differential equations. Differential equations are local, right? So this is a differential equation, right? And it does not care about any particular ith point. So look at this equation. This equation doesn't uh, in that case, why is E of minus grad phi not the local relation? Which one? Uh, just the relation about E defined as minus of grad phi. Yes. So this, if I have this relation over here. Right. That too should be local, right? Yeah. That, 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 right. I mean, okay. This is also local, but you know, this one we had over here where we had this, all these problems over there, where we had this infinities and stuff like that. We'll come back to this relation again. We'll come back to this relation. This relation gives you, okay, why? Fine, I understand. This is a local relation. We are trying to go towards Maxwell's equation. Maxwell's equation, you do not write down the above relation. You write down the second relation, right? Everything is written in terms of curl and divergences. Okay, so basically we're trying to build differential equations so that we can solve it. Exactly, we're trying to build different. So we have built one differential equation very trivially. Now let us see whether we can build the other differential equations. Okay, so this, the way I have written this, this is basically the gradient of a potential, right? This is the gradient of potential. So those should be R's, right? Not R's. Those should be R's, exactly. Thank you for pointing it out. Those should be R's, yes, because this is R. Very, very, thank you very much. This is exactly my point. Oops, hold on. That should be ours. Yeah. As soon as I become a less little careful, they get all this kind of crap happening. So this, okay, now what I want, I want to rewrite this a little bit. Okay. okay. And this is nothing but So in case some of you are having a question of why this is your solid angle omega j, think of it like this. Okay. So you can think of uh, some surface. Let us write down some surface, whatever. Okay. Now think of some point in the surface. And you have 
put here. This is the DS. And you have some point inside the surface, okay, which is my J. So it is QJ over here, Q at this position J. And I draw a line to this and I draw a perpendicular to this. Now, if you look at this thing, this is my, so there is the DS and then there's a the projected area. So this line is my projected area. Right. And so this in some sense is the element of the area. And this is perpendicular, as I said, this is this is perpendicular to the line joining QJ. So this is Q. Right? This what it is. This is the jth position. Okay. So this element of this area, this DA, if you think of it, this is my DS. R minus RJ. Now DA over R minus RJ squared nothing but so this is the solid angle which is subtended by this ds on qj so this is why i can write it by formula like this now once we have this once we have this volume and this formula of course we have two possibilities right the possibility one is where the charge is are inside the volume and the possibility two where the charges are outside the volume so we have two possibilities. Okay. So one is QJ inside the volume. And two is QJ outside the volume. Okay. So this basically tells us if I integrate my D omega J with QJ inside the volume or outside the volume, it will either be zero or it will pick up the total solid angle of four pi. So this tells us that my integral of uh, the total solid angle over the surface, this will either be four pi if possibility one or it will be zero if the possibility is zero. So the first one, if the charges are inside the volume, it will pick up this total solid angle. And of course, the charge outside the volume, it will not pick up anything. And so I can rewrite my formula over here. And you can rewrite this as my integral over ds. E by R is equal to a sum over J inside um, inside volume four by J. We still have to go to a form where I said things will be local in the sense that things will have local differential equation forms. The way to do that is to go from this point charge to a continuous distribution. If you can do that, then we'll see that we can write down in an equivalently local differential equation form. Okay. So we want to move to a continuous distribution of 
rho of r. So where rho of r is been nothing but the volume density of charge. Right. So this part of this right hand side of the previous equation over here, this qj, where j inside volume, this part. This is basically right. And my dr is basically the sum over the all the volumes. Okay. So my dr is basically dx dy dz. Now, again, I have to say that sometimes I'm sloppy. I don't remember. Sometimes I write dr, sometimes I write d3r, sometimes I write dv, but I mean, you know what it is. It's a volume integral. Okay. So it's a- Sir, but a, dr will confuse, right? Can you say it again? A dr may will confuse. I can't hear you. You have to say it louder, please. Sir, dr may confuse because we also write the line element as dr also. Okay, I can write it as dq bar. Yeah, d3r is fine. Yeah, d3r. Fine. D3. Yeah, I mean, okay, sometimes even books you'll see that there is a dr with this r being a, you know, yeah, doesn't matter. I mean, you have to be just, you know, if it's a volume uh, thing, if the argument is uh, volume dependent, then you have, you're multiplying by something which is a volume. So this kind of stuff you can, you know, just define. Yes, sir. One more thing. Uh, I have a class at two. So, how much long will this class will go? I will finish it. We'll try, try to quickly finish it. Quickly, I will finish. In a, in a, in a five minutes, I will finish. Okay. <laughs> I started late. I want to complete this part and before we move on to. Okay. Now, point charges, of course, we didn't have point charges in this thing, but in the equations that we had till now, it has point charges. So, of course, we have to write down the point charges. So the point charges can be written very easily. So if I think of my rho r, my rho r is basically sum over j, qj, and delta r minus rj. But delta is the delta function, three-dimensional delta function, okay. So my delta is the delta function and let's define that if I have a delta function, if I integrate my delta function, delta R minus RJ, okay. This is equal to one or zero, depending where, depending on whether RJ is inside V or RJ is outside V. So if I put this thing back in my previous equation, this equation and this equation combined, then what we get is this. So if we put this thing, so putting all of these things together, putting things together, we will have four pi rho r, because we had this thing, we had four pi qj, right? So four pi qj becomes a four pi rho r. So integral over here, over the volume, okay, rho of r. This gives you my surface integral, which is the surface. This again, I change it to the volume integral, the second one. And so from this equation, what we get is now if we look at this equation, we have achieved what we wanted before, right? So we achieved another differential equation 
Okay, this is local. It depends on any r. You take any r. This is what this equation, differential equation, will be at any r. It does not care about the position of the charges i or j. Okay, so it's a local differential equation. So we add with this the one that we had before, which was the curl of E. Okay. Then you have these two differential equations. So these two differential equations, so we have now two equations. Okay. This completely specify P of R. When boundary conditions are applied, these are differential equations. To solve it, we need boundary conditions. So these two equations completely specify E of R when the boundary conditions are applied. And of course, the simplest boundary condition and the most logical boundary condition is this: is my E goes to zero as R it was very large and this is the boundary condition okay. so in the problem that i gave you was basically this problem and over there the key thing that i guess almost everyone missed is the important point in that problem that the three things were given that the curl of e is this the divergence of e is this and the boundary condition is this the simple boundary condition, the boundary condition is most important of all. This boundary condition implies a unique solution. So if I have this boundary condition, this actually implies a unique solution. Okay. So it's very important to use the boundary condition. A lot of people have just taken the differences and basically Say so this is equal to zero, but that should be equal to rho of r. So that's equal. That's not the way to do it. You have to do it a little more carefully. Okay. So let me give you again problem two. Okay. Show. So this is a chance of doing it again. Show that the show that the two differential equations of E of R plus the boundary condition implies a unique solution. To okay. so this is something that you should also do. Okay. okay, so we are in the last 30 seconds. I want to wrap it up. So we started with Coulomb's energy, right? We started with Coulomb's energy and we derive the equations of electrostatics, okay? So we started with Coulomb's energy of pairwise interaction energy. And from there, we have derived the equations of electrostatics. So we have derived, so starting point is Coulomb's energy, okay? And from there, we have derived, this is the divergence of E should be four pi rho. The curl of E should be zero. And because we started with Coulomb's energy, so it was electrostatics, the two other things that we have over here is my del rho, del T is equal to zero, and del E del T is equal to zero. Okay. So these are my equations of electrostatics. Okay. Some of the Maxwell's equation already hidden over here. This Maxwell's equation also does describe electrostatics. You can see this part of the Maxwell's equation or with whatever modified form of Maxwell's equation already gives us electrostatics because we started with this very simple pairwise interaction of electrostatics. So the next day, what I'm going to do is we're going to go to electrodynamics. And the way to do it is that we're going to move Sir, to the but the solution of the electric field is still Solution of? 
Nikhil, tell me again. The solution of this uh, equation, solution of this equation will again contain the what you call the portion of the charges. The solution of these equations will appear, but you know this will not be the complete solution as you know. I mean, we all all of you have done Maxwell's equation. This was when you start yeah, with the statics. We have to bring time somehow, and that's what we're going to do next. We're going to bring in time, and we're going to bring in time in a very, very interesting way. We are good. So remember, this is where all the charges were at rest. Now, if I make every charge move, then we'll see that these equations, obviously, this del t del rho will change. That will move because charges are moving. But all the other equations for self consistency has to change. And is the self consistency of things when charges are moving. I told you, remember, we will have to bring in Galilean invariance and stuff like that. Because this is how we're going to derive it. Electrostatics, first part we have done. Second part, we're going to build in Galilean relativity, not yet special zero relativity because velocities will be small. And ultimately, we'll see that that was not going to matter. And then finally, we'll bring in C. So next day, we'll basically move the charges and go towards the next part of the Maxwell situation. And then we'll go to C. Sir, hello. Yes. So in that question number two, what is wrong if, if we assume that there is a uh, Two solutions and then we prove that the two solutions are actually two solutions definitely so what is wrong in that i assume that there is a solution e1 and e2 and then i prove that no e1 is equals to e2 are, are you using are you using both the equations or are you just using one equation uh i am oh, the second have second have equation is identity right del cross e is zero so i'm using just the first equation del dot e yes. Then I'm saying, but why then are you giving two equations? No, we That's need to use the second the equation. equation right? Somehow you must use the other equation also. Uh, for use. Maxwell's equation, there is a uniqueness theorem that the for a whatever boundary conditions you take, the solution is always unique. So you don't need to specify the boundary condition. Okay, when we'll do this problem, I'll, I'll tell you. This three-line answer is not enough. So I know some of you have done three as just basically taken, let's take E1, let's take E2, let's subtract E1 minus E2, and that will give you zero, but we already have four pi rho, so E1 has to be E2. Yes, that is not enough. This no, I have not done using that. I have assumed this, I have calculated the uh, del dot V3 E3. E3 is equals to E1 minus E2. Mm -hmm. And then this is equals to E3 square integral D tau. That is equals to zero. So if E3 square integral over volume is zero, it means that E3 has to be zero at every point. I'll, I'll check. Um, so who is speaking Saur, there? Saur, Saurav Suman. Saurav, okay. I, I have not checked your... Uh, yeah, I have also done this in the same session. See, if you have done it right, then you've done it right. I mean, I have not checked all the, all the uh, answers of all the students. I have randomly picked up uh, some of the students yeah. and I've looked at just it. because the integral of e1 vector minus e2 vector dot ds is zero thus that doesn't imply that e1 equals to e2 but if the mod square integral over volume is zero that implies ah, that yes yes exactly so you have to go to the grad square term yeah yes square. yes so move most of you have not gone to the grad square term. I'll check your answer. I have not checked your answer. So anyway, we'll start again on Friday. Uh, hopefully things are, this is the first class, things are not too difficult. Uh, things are easy, you've, most of you have done these things. But the idea was to do it in a slightly, I don't think everyone has done it the way I'm doing it right now. Uh, most of the books don't do it like this, but uh, we'll slowly move into, uh, slightly more technical stuff, okay? So, on Friday. Sir, one question. Yes. Initially, we talked about the... Okay, hold on. Ah, uh, Nikhil, Nikhil. Ah, Nikhil, ah. So, initially, we talked about the local part of the equation. So, initially, when we are writing the electric field, we are getting that it depends on the position of the charges also. So here also it will depend, right? So in the sense, it will not remain local, the solution in that sense, if you are talking. No, no, no. Go through the arguments again slowly. 
go through the arguments again just read through it there are places where i have gone from the rirj thing into no rirj sir one thing i need to ask uh, amit uh, sir uh, hello sir uh, amit yeah tell me uh, yes sir uh, sir uh, the whole thing that you have derived uh, is uh, you don't talk about anything uh, related to the dimension of the problem uh, at which dimension uh, i guess uh, uh, if the 2d process we uh, proceed uh, would be the things will be same i mean that so i talk about the dimension remember at the very beginning the whole of electrostatics the whole thing is derived from our basic knowledge of electrostatics which told us that this would be interaction energy how do you get this interaction energy what is the microphysics we don't know people have used looked at charges somehow they have found that this is the interaction energy of a n number of charges okay over there is already a dimension is there that the dimension of the charges should be much much less than the dimension of the of your of of the distance between them so at any point whether you are doing something surface you are doing something in the surface or in any any um, 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 what do you call them depending on how you put this charges on whatever two dimensional surface or three dimensional surface if this criteria is not followed that your separation between the charges are much larger than the separation uh, than the size of the charges itself then nothing of this works out so when you talk about two dimensional surface when you talk about surface of a material over there you have to be careful how you are doing it okay okay yeah yeah Okay, very good. I think it's time for lunch. We meet on uh, Friday at four o'clock. Remember, huh? not three thirty, four o'clock. So, yes. So, will the drop test be rescheduled? Huh? Will the drop test be rescheduled because under this condition it is not possible to uh, take it in physical examination, right? Uh, depends on where you want to. Do. Yeah, we can do it a week later. Okay. So still now is the only two people who wants to give the drop test. Are there more people who wants to give the drop test? Okay, <laughs> we'll see. We'll do it. Okay, for now, for now the the that was uh, uh, scheduled before now stands cancelled. Right? Which one? Uh, that was scheduled before. For now, this one is cancelled. Ah, huh, for now this one is cancelled. I mean, okay. Sir. Two people, one can always give a drop test. If there is two people, one can always give, go to a room and give a drop test. But we can give it. You can, uh, you know, extend this by a week. We can do it. Okay, 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 okay. I have no problem. Start doing your problems. It will be good for you, for all of you. Just because then it's easy. You don't have to do it all of them at the end. So I'll stop over here. Uh, Arthur, you can stop the recording. Okay.